Nous accueillons maintenant le professeur Kay Colmeyer. Alors, euh, là encore, est-il besoin de présenter euh, l'homme qui a découvert le temple du dieu de l'orage d'Alep, euh, ce temple dont les, euh, dont les textes euh, du Proche-Orient ancien nous parlaient beaucoup et qui effectivement existait bien euh, et a été donc découvert euh, dans les fondations de la, de la citadelle d'Alep. Alors, avant de découvrir le temple du dieu de l'orage, Kay Colmeyer, évidemment, a, a beaucoup travaillé sur le monde anatolien et euh, il a notamment euh, soutenu sa, sa thèse euh, qui s'intitulait euh, Felsbilder der euh, Etitischen Großreichszeit. Euh, euh, qui euh, notamment a été publié en 1983 dans la revue Acta Prehistorica et Archaeologica et qui est un, euh, comment euh, un élément important pour euh, la connaissance justement euh, des, euh, des reliefs rupestres hittites dont nous avons vu quelques exemplaires tout à l'heure euh, pendant la, la communication de Yit. Et euh, il enseigne actuellement à euh, la Hochschule für Technisch, euh, Technik und Wirtschaft à Berlin. Et euh, il a donc dirigé les fouilles de la citadelle d'Alep euh, et des fouilles également au Sri Lanka. Et tout dernièrement, il était le co-commissaire de l'exposition Syria Matters qui a été présentée à Doha. Je vous laisse donc en compagnie de Kay Colmeyer qui va vous parler euh, de ce temple du dieu de l'orage d'Alep, un moment clé et charnière dans l'histoire de la sculpture monumentale syro-anatolienne entre l'âge du bronze et l'âge du fer. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I would like to thank you very, very much, Vincent, for the invitation and for you all coming. I'm really fascinated how many come to such a lecture. Uh, I'm not used to it in Berlin, I must tell you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the inland route that uh, links Anatolia with the south of Syria and Palestine passes through the agricultural lands of the interior at the point where it crosses the shortest distance between the Euphrates and the Mediterranean coast lies Aleppo. Such crossroads served as a hub for extensive cultural and also scientific exchange. Travelers were always deeply impressed by the citadel hill of Aleppo, the most important Islamic medieval military construction in Syria. But during pre-Islamic periods, it was the seat of the weather god of Aleppo, ancient Halpa. He played a super-regional role in the ancient Near East, which explains the, the enormous size of his temple and the brilliance of its architectural decoration. The god and his temple demonstrate a defining characteristic of Syria's ancient history, the ability to integrate different religions. In the third millennium BCE, the storm god was worshipped as Hadda, and the rulers of Ebla, the capital uh, 40 kilometers to the south, carried out restoration in his temple. Early Bronze Age spearheads in a foundation deposit with uh, clear parallels in, to the so-called treasure of Prime and Troy, uh, give evidence to far-reaching relations. In the early second millennium, Western Semitic immigrants called him Adu. He gained great significance as head of the pantheon of Yamrat, the Emirate kingdom ruled from Aleppo. Middle Bronze Age sculptures were influenced by Ebla, see them here, at the same time providing that relief autostats, a very typical Near Eastern, ancient Near Eastern architectural decoration, origin in northern Syria. In the later second millennium, the Hurrians called him Teshop, the name under which he was venerated in the Hittites' capital. He stood in a prominent position in the order of gods as guarantors in international treaties, and adorned the official seal of the Hittite great king, Morshili III. Among the Luvians, he was called Tahunta Tahunsa, and in, in the marine world, he, in the first millennium, he was Harat. Elsewhere, one can see uh, cultic continuations, but nowhere 
are they manifested for so long a period as in the Temple of the Weather God of Aleppo. The focus of this talk is on the Hittite and Luvian periods, but I have to explain the layout of the temple in the previous period in order to work out specific Hittite influence. When the Hittites conquered Syria, they did not exchange the local, uh, local rulers except in two important cities. Shupiluluma I established in, Ma in Kakemish one son as viceroy, and in Aleppo another son as high priest. Whereas we can observe a cultural continuity in the architecture in the other cities, Aleppo shows us a strong Hittite influence, and certainly it would be the same case as at Kakemish, whenever layers of this period will be exposed. The layout of the temple in the early second millennium in red, blue indicates the third millennium, with a broad room of 27 by 17 meters and an antechamber flanked on one side by a staircase, embodies an unusual type of a so-called tower temple or Migdal temple in Syria. It has parallels in the Amok plain and in Palestine, Haza, Sichem. You see, or oh, excuse me, on the next slide. Although they are smaller than the Aleppo temple with uh, external dimensions of more than 40 by 40 meters. Terracotta models from the Euphrates Valley show this specific temple type. In the third and early second millennium, the entrance uh, and the cult niche lay on the same axis. This system was temporarily modified under the Hittites when the cult orientation changed to a band axis. It was later restored to the old system. What happened uh, in the course of the Hittite rebuilding? The plain slabs from the former cellar walls, these ones here, were replaced, no, excuse me, these ones, no, were replaced by reliefs. The majority of them shows so-called Fels windows, others bull men, and the weather god in the center of the eastern cellar wall. In the northernmost part, the earlier slabs were hidden when the inner alignment of the northern wall was shifted towards the south and the former cult niche buried. I have to return to the last next year. This is the new inner alignment and the older cult niche is buried. The trans location of the weather god's seat from the north to the center of the east wall reflects the Hittite system of approach to a god, which necessitates a quarter turn for anyone entering. Windows, which could be opened with lattices or shelters, played an important function in the Hittite temple cult. But the former entrance could not be changed without huge alteration and the windows could not build in otherwise than as mere illusion. The reliefs of the eastern, southern, and presumably western cellar walls depict Fels windows, I told you, and bullmen, two bullmen. They are characterized by a sophisticated Hittite style with best comparison to uh, an ivory plaque from Megiddo. The lattice of the Fels windows is strikingly similar to Hittite temple models, you'll see here from Borske Ratosha. And during the erection of medieval cellar rooms, some slabs were obviously excavated and reused for the upper uh, Umayyad mosque of the citadel. The two meters high smiting god wears a typical horned cap a rosette, a decorated shirt, and rom pattern kilt. He has an epigraph, see here, uh, which is identical to the one of the weather god of, Ape of Aleppo on the seal of Moshele III that I've shown you before. His short dagger appears again on a second slightly damaged relief of the god with litors and lance, which was found in a pit. Both depictions have typical Hittite proportions for their bodies, with oversized legs and heads, 
oversized ears and eyes. It is a strong possibility that the god with Litos belonged to a series of gods which decorated an upper zone above the Fels windows and ballmen. The platform, which was raised south to the new northern wall, has a relief decoration at its front side. Three reliefs are still in situ, but smoothened to create a flat surface for later reliefs, and the others were later completely exchanged. The remaining reliefs depict a mountain god and two composite monsters with winged body, lion body. One has a human head with horn headdress, the small lion head on the breast, and the others, other ones has a bird head and a small snake's head. Parallels in glyptic art, especially from Meskene, uh, nowadays Ema, indicate that they belong to a regional Syrian Hittite cultural variety with Hurrian influences. The inner gateway was protected with fish genius and a sphinx and a lion. Most astonishing is the fish genius, uh, two meters high, which follows Mesopotamian models. You see a cassite uh, cylinder seal here, the imprint. And uh, so maybe the work of a Hittite artist with Babylonian experiences or a Babylonian artist. The genius holds a pine cone as purifier in a bucket. The sculptures of the lion and the sphinx, as well as the image of the weather god himself, are of the same quality as those from the Hittite capital, suggesting that artists of the royal court were employed. Few fragments survived from a lion at the eastern gateway wall. They bear few signs of a Hittite inscription. Gateway inscriptions are well known from later from Luvian Aramean cities. An alteration in the 11th century BC was the removal of a now lost relief by the side of the weather god and its replacement by a king's image. With a king now in front of the storm god or weather god, the sense of the depiction changed to a dedication scene and the cult direction was altered again to the former straight one. Due to the narrow rectangular size of the slab, and what's more imp uh, important, the rather realistic proportional system of Luvian Aramean human depictions, the king raises his eyes above the storm god's head. Should be impossible. Attached to the king, is a long incised inscription in uh, hieroglyphic Luvian, which mentions cult instructions for the weather god of Aleppo and identifies the king with Taita, ruler of the Palestine people, a group of the sea peoples who contributed to the fall of palace cultures in the late second millennium in Syria and Egypt. To him belongs a lion at the entrance, uh, all very fragmented, unfortunately, opposite to the Hittite lion with the inscription. Obviously, this lion was produced as a replacement for a destroyed Hittite figure. The lion has an incised hieroglyphic inscription too, which continues over the head of the Sphinx. The inscription does not give further information for Taita, Here's a complete inscription, but mentions Karkemish and Mules from Egypt, possibly indicating international relations. This slice gives you an overview, a summary of Titus' reconstruction of the temple and re-establishment of the former cult axis. David Hawkins dates the king on paleographic and historical grounds to the 11th century BCE, a date which corresponds with radiocarbon dating from the site. Titus' cultic revival obviously followed traditional lines, both in visual representation and in use of hieroglyphic, uh, Luvian hieroglyphs. On the other hand, his title, King of Palestine, suggests connections with the Philistines, and this might be corroborated by the appearance 
of Eastern Mediterranean influenced uh, ceramics in northern Syria. Knowledge of the building in Aleppo, the sequence, helps us to understand the famous Temple of Ain Dara and its decoration too. The right part of the temple is unfortunately now completely destroyed by an air attack. As there are some sculptures now clearly attributable to the Hittite period, like these and others to the Tite, Tite period, and also the famous lion standing outside of the temple itself in Ayandara has clear similarities to the Tite figurines in Aleppo. The last alteration dates to around 900 BCE or a little bit before, when the reliefs at the front of the northern platform were exchanged. The new decoration shows the weather god with his entourage of other gods and hybrid creatures. During the restoration works, the entire burn temple burned down and was abandoned. The reliefs were surely executed at the same time, but by different workshops, some more traditional, some more progressive. Some of the reliefs are unfinished. I will show you the reliefs very briefly, very shortly. The first one we discovered in a cell room, two balls and a tree of life. The next, a, horn, a god with a horn capped and a short kilt carries a double rod and the other holds a bow. Then there is a god with pointed helmet. He stands on a ribbon, which might symbolize water. The pair of uh, thunderbolts, which he carries in one hand, reveals his role as storm god, weather god. The crook in his other hand, his role as tutelary god. Followed by a sphinx and a lion, in rather bad quality, the stone, which might give an uh, indication that the slabs were covered with metal sheets, perhaps silver or gold sheets. And then follows a very astonishing composite monster, which is notable for its uh, Mesopotamian origin. Two-legged with human head, the body of a bird or a scorpion, tail of scorpion, lion claws and a small lion head on the breast. It walks across a stillized mountain, and we know this monster, a Girtab Lulu, uh, which appears in Mesopotamia, and uh, they have an apotropaic function in the Neo-Assyrian period. The next one is a warrior god, which is about to thrust his sword into the breast of an enemy, and you see to the left uh, forerunners. It's quite clear in the tradition of the second millennium, an ivory from Ugarit and a Hittite seal impression. The next one is also very interesting, a winged goddess with a club and a sound instrument. This instrument is not finished, but we have a comparison I will show you later. Uh, this is obviously uh, the depiction of a Shaushka figure. And then follows a god carrying a spear and a bow, with an hieroglyphic epigraph which designates him as Corinthi Corinthia, the tutelary god of wild animals. Followed by the weather god himself, who is just about to enter his two wheeled chariot drawn by a bull, the particular type of a crossbar wheel on his chair of his chariot is rather antiquated and follows a model of the first half of the the uh, second millennium. The god is shouldering a pointed club, and the mace symbol as an epigraph designates him in his special role. A text of the early second millennium mentions the weapons of the storm god of Aleppo in his fight against the sea temptu, and this forerunner of the Ugaritic myth of a fight between Baal and uh, god of the sea might date back to the third millennium BC, as in Ebla, the motive of the fighting weather god of Aleppo is known too. 
The weapons to maces also play a major role in the Ugaritic myth. And the victori victorious, victorious uh, weapons are not only attributes of the god, but also cult objects. And bearing this tradition in mind, one is not surprised to discover this particular hieroglyph, uh, until now unknown hieroglyph, for the weather god of Aleppo. It follows this god with uh, mace and spear, and then a winged genius with a bird's head in one hand, he holds a bucket, and in the other hand a purifier in the form of a pine cone. Uh, this type of a griffin demon is well known from Neo-Assyrian depictions, especially from uh, the palace of Ashurnasapal II in Nimrud. And like the Girtablulu, these Apkalo were considered to have an apotropaic aspect, and as figurines they were buried in houses in protective rituals. Then there is another mixed creature with a lion's head, again with bucket and the front as a cleaning device, purifying device. A goddess with cylindric cylindrical headgear, so-called Syrian goddess, wears two kivers, a mace, and she has this sound instrument now executed, which we also find in the hand of the Shaushka. Then there is a god with spear we cannot identify. There are in total three bullmen, bullmen figures with different headdresses, while the earlier Hittite bullmen clearly have a supported, supporting function, the later bullmen are apotropaic figures. They were go, well, therefore go very well uh, together with the other protective demons. Then we have other uh, figures like the demon with a winged body, you see on the right, lion legs, scorpion tail and lion's head. Unidentified are the god to the left, uh, which is a tutorial god, uh, god anyhow, and a god with a short kilt. He's also carrying a crook in his hand and a torch in the other. We know that there is a god of a torch in the Hittite pantheon of Aleppo. And then at the end, there are two antithetical lines leaping upon each other. Once again, uh, the god I mentioned, the tutelary god, and another bullman. As I mentioned before, there are different sculptors working on the reliefs at the same time. For dating the last renovation, we have to look at the work of the most progressive artist who executed the god with a bundle of thunderbolts and a crook. This relief has strong similarities to the Kakamish group of Sohi Katuva and gives us a date around the last decades before 900 BC. The most traditional sculptors worked in the central group of the warrior group, uh, the warrior group, the Shaushka, Gruntia, and the storm god himself. Perhaps they needed a more conservative depiction and only here hieroglyphic names occur. I characterized Aleppo as a hub of knowledge exchange, and you have seen the artistic evidence in the temple's decoration, which provides important information on the Luvian Armenian art, its Hittite, Syrian, and Mesopotamian roots, as well as its influence on Neo Assyrian sculptures. How can we explain processes like tradition, transfer of pictorial thought, or similarities or continuity? of artistic expression. On the one hand, as is often assumed, by the migration of small art objects, the same goes with these Hittite small objects, bronze figurines or metal, uh, gold and silver uh, objects, which were used as cult objects. On the other hand, uh, and you see here a lion head, uh, as an example which shows clear proximity for North Syrian ivory carvings. Uh, then there is a movement of sculptors. I consider this with the Mesopotamian fish genius or the Hittite epoch. Another example is shown here, a clear correspondence of the Aleppo balls 
to reliefs in the palace of Ashurnasirpal II. This phenomenon was explained as a common convention that existed parallel in Assyria and northern Syria as overlapping artistic languages. Another explanation was that the peaceful bulls of Aleppo being killed in the gruesome tableau at Nimrud served as an option for ideological and propagandistic purposes. That means a symbol of Aleppo's weakness and vulnerability to a serious might. I disagree with both theories. With a large number of prisoners from northern Syria brought by the Assyrian ruler in his capital, it is more plausible that deported Syrian artisans continued to work in their way when they decorated Ashurnasirpal's palace. A special feature of the relief decoration of the temple is that although it came from different times, different epochs, it was always visible together. And the older reliefs could serve as direct models for later ones. Thus, the bullmen of the Hittite period formed the template for representations of a last construction phase, whereby the support function was changed to an apartheid gesture and the hairstyle was partially misunderstood. The temple was therefore also a site of, let's say, sculptural education of an artistic transfer. Thank you very much. <laughs>